Those looking to save whales and support industry in Massachusetts Bay have converged on a surprisingly painless solution. Rarely, though, does the intersection of ocean stewardship and societal demands flow so smoothly. And nowhere has the challenge been so deeply tested than in America's most beloved coral reef. The Florida Keys are the fossilized tips of a vast coral kingdom, some 4,500 stepping stones leading south in the Caribbean blue. Majestic, three-dimensional features constructed by multitudes of tiny animals. These reefs are the equivalent of an oceanic rainforest, sheltering creatures wearing every color in the rainbow. But also they are an ever busier playground and workplace of sightseers and divers, sailors and fishermen. 20 years ago, a fisherman of the Florida Keys named Billy Causey took what would amount to the leap of a lifetime. Causey went from earning his living catching fish to protecting those same fish as the first manager of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. The response from Causey's own community has come to symbolize the rough waters of marine conservation in a world of competing uses. Billy was, uh, in this hemisphere, probably hated to the, uh, with the locals as much as Castro was to the, the Miami Latins. And at that time, there was a lot of public angst. I mean, everybody saw it as a, a restriction of their rights and liberties to go out and fish whatever they wanted to, whenever they wanted to, wherever they wanted to. And you start taking away somebody's rights and liberties, there's, there's, going to be, there's going to be a moment of truth for everybody. The process got so contentious in 1992 that I was hung in effigy. And I, I don't really like to talk about that because it was a tough day for me. So I was part of the crowd with the, with the rope and the crosses at first outside of Billy Causey's window when they, went, when they hung him in effigy. As you can imagine, people, first they were concerned about all of a sudden this big federal footprint that surrounded their community. They were concerned about what a sanctuary was going to do to their livelihoods. And they were concerned about whether or not they should engage in a stakeholder-driven process. After three major ship groundings in the Keys within one month, the legislation immediately routed large ships away from the fragile coral reefs and banned oil drilling within the sanctuary. But the effects from global climate change, water pollution, and many other demands kept taking its toll on the Florida Keys. I used to get uh, calls by the dive operators who would be complaining about the charter fishing boats that would troll close to the reef and their fish would get hooked on and they would wrap around divers and I would get calls from families that were upset that people were spearfishing right next to them at, at one of the reefs or I'd get calls from dive charter boats who had tropical fish collectors collecting right on the top of the reefs where they were. So there were all these conflicts in these areas. Causey forged ahead, forming the nation's first Sanctuary Advisory Council, bringing in respected representatives of all that had a stake in the health of the Keys. Tourism is the number one industry here in the Keys. People come down here to go fishing. They come down here to go diving. They come down here to enjoy our climate, our environment, to enjoy the beaches. They come down here just to hang out in Key West. The tourists that come down here spend $1.2 billion every year. And that's before the economic multipliers kick in. So someone has to be here to keep a pulse on the, this environment while the 4 million visitors come down every year to enjoy this environment. 
We have a public process here as well as sanctuary. The council's council solution was to partition the key's most critical areas. I understand where you're coming from. Borrowing some time-tested techniques from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the council adopted a special set of marine zones to protect the sensitive reefs from overuse and to separate conflicting uses. And ironically, in separating the people, it brought them together. Bringing people together to talk about a problem is step one. I can only speak from my experiences here and how it was done here, and it was done right. The protecting of sensitive marine areas, that seems to cover a lot of the concerns. Everybody's involved, and everybody gets to hear what everybody has to say. It works out fine for us. I don't know any charter boat fishermen here that would say that the uh, sanctuary preservation areas have hurt their business. Um, uh, I don't know anybody that would say that. Then as time goes on, I guess, you know, you do some soul searching, I know I did. Just do, you know, was I right, was I wrong? Anybody who doesn't re revisit a decision that, that you, you have a question about it, it makes a big mistake in life. Uh, so I, I revisited that revisited that decision and said, well, maybe it was the right thing because I'm still catching fish here. I'm not fishing there, but I'm, I'm still catching fish there. So what did it really take away from me? So is it really hurting me? No, and if it does some good, so much the better. And then when you see that it does some good, they said, hey, maybe we should close some other areas. Protecting both their businesses and the ecosystem, in 2001, the Sanctuary Advisory Council established the no-take Tortugas Ecological Reserve. At that time, the largest fully protected marine area in the country. The collaboration in the Keys has since gained worldwide praise as a model for marine reserve design. Now what's really exciting is that the Tortugas, which are to the west of us from right here about 70 miles, are upstream of the Florida Keys. As the current moves between us and Cuba, a series of counterclockwise gyres spin off. And anything spawning in the Tortugas is spread in the larvae. So those larvae are carried all the way up the Keys and then they're sprinkled into the grass beds, into the nursery areas. They grow up there, they move out to the reefs and they start spawning again. This past year, we saw the reestablishment of a fish spawning aggregation site, which were mutton snapper, a very important species to the fishing community here in the Keys. And they're back in huge numbers, which is a huge success. It really worked out you know, in our best interest that they're protecting these resources because what they protect helps us in the long run. So um, we have a really good relationship with the sanctuary, Billy, the sanctuary, everyone. You know, we've always worked with them really well. The NGOs, World Wildlife Fund, Nature Conservancy, groups like that, they all have representatives usually at sanctuary meetings and we all work together and, you know, we do what's best for the environment. If it makes sense, the fishermen are for it. If it doesn't make sense to us, you know, we can have a problem with it. But uh, in general, you know, we hash these things out and uh, we try and do what's best for the resources. But you, you will still have some people to this day that believe that, no, we have some inalienable right to fish wherever, whenever, for whatever, and catch how many we want. Because the fish are always going to be there. That's bull. I mean, why is the fish always going to be there? Who says that? Where is it written? But we have seen a turn in this community, and we've seen people that realize that we're not going to put them out of business. Our job is to keep them in business. Our job is to make sure that there are fish and, and other resources here for the future. Our job is to make sure that the dive industry has mooring buoys to tie up to when they go to the reef so they don't destroy the very resource that brings their customers to the Keys. Our job is to make sure that these groups have something here in the future to make a living off. Despite initial struggles and hostilities, the Key's future has turned on the strength of leadership and teamwork. Successfully establishing the United States' first ever comprehensive ocean plan. 
no longer fighting over the last fish or dive site, the Sanctuary Advisory Council is now directing their energy towards eliminating water pollution to protect the Keys for the long term. And this is what I get up every day to go to work to do, is to say, what can I do locally and what can I do regionally and how can I influence what's happening on a global scale? And our ocean policy, our national ocean policy now, gives us a framework endorsed by the highest levels of this government and this administration to go out and address those problems. For Kazi and the keepers of the Keys, all have begun to realize that the fate of their beloved reefs is far more than a Florida affair. The good and bad all flow with the water currents that come to the Keys. And I also have to be looking over my shoulder upstream at the Mississippi River and 40% of North America that drains into the Gulf of Mexico.